Good morning and welcome to River Church. It's Sunday morning, June 7th, and I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield. In just a couple of hours, uh, River Church people will be uh, filling this building, worshiping together publicly. Uh, but we realize that some of you aren't yet ready to get out, and so we're producing this video just for you so that you can join us virtually at 11 a.m., and we're glad that you've chosen to do that. In just a few minutes, we're going to get started, so I invite you to prepare yourself, maybe fill up your cup of coffee and get rid of distractions. Go get your Bible and a notepad and something to write with. Um, if you want to know more about River Church or you want to know about upcoming activities, maybe you want to get more connected to the church, go to our website, riverchurchrgb.com, and you'll find out all the information you, you would need uh, regarding our church. If you want to communicate with, with me or one of the elders, uh, if you uh, want to send us a message or, or get more information, be in contact with us in any way, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgb.com, and, and we'll respond and we'll take care of your needs. Well, we're going to get started in just a few minutes, so see you then. We as human beings are an inquisitive group, aren't we? We just love to ask questions. We love to crack codes. We love mysteries and unsolved mysteries. Uh, my kids, they ask questions about everything. It seems nonstop with the questions. I remember my 14-year-old son, uh, Nolan, when he was a little boy, uh, he began researching the legitimacy of the Loch Ness Monster and the Yeti. That's the, the snowman Bigfoot. Uh, now, he eventually decided against the, the likelihood that either exists, but he was fascinated by the prospect. Uh, because we're an we're a inquisitive uh, group of people, us human beings. Um, recently, in the Caulfield House, We've been listening to some, uh, Bo some Bob Dylan. He, he, he just recently dropped a, a new song about three weeks ago called Murder Most Foul. And it's a 10-minute song in which he goes on and on and on about the, 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 the murder, the assassination of J uh, President John F. Kennedy and the ensuing conspiracy theories that followed. Uh, we just love that as, a, as, as human beings. We, we love conspiracy theories and unsolved mysteries and myths because human beings are inquisitive. We like to crack codes. Now, uh, 2020, June of 2020, uh, we live in an era of conspiracy theories. Uh, we live in an era of countless wormholes on the internet that you can explore and uh, I'm embarrassed to say that, that, that in the general public, uh, sometimes we, as Christians, um, we're considered a gullible group of people. Now, now, to some degree, maybe that's a bad rap, but to some degree, I mean, I've watched um, our uh, social media patterns uh, and tendencies, and, and to some degree, we've earned this idea that, that Christians can be a gullible group of people who love conspiracy theories and, and love to one moment uh, post uh, the supremacy of Christ in their lives and the importance of the death, burial, and resurrection. And the ne next moment, we're posting things that, that may seem a little crazy or a little, make us look a little gullible. Um, a recent Pew poll said that Republicans who tend to be the most religious of the political parties, I think we could agree on that, are, most, are the most likely group uh, to believe that COVID-19 was created in a lab. About four in 10 Republicans believe that. Uh, now I'm sure that, that you might want to argue that point with me as, uh, regarding the, the legitimacy of that fact. Uh, we can talk about that another time. Uh, but, but today, uh, here's where we're going. Uh, we're living in this, this dual age, uh, both under the shadow of a global pandemic and in our country, we're living under the shadow of this national period of civil unrest. And so we've got these two clouds looming over us. Real trouble. Real trial. And what we're talking about today is this. The purpose of trouble and the pain of indecisiveness. The purpose of trouble and the pain of indecisiveness. Out of the book of James. Um, indecisiveness. It means when we... 
We don't have the ability to make up our minds. You know, one day we're going this way, one day we're going that direction. Uh, we're clear or unclear and vague and inconclusive and undecided and uh, proving nothing, always wondering. Uh, um, the inability to make up your mind, my mind. Indecisiveness. I'll give you an example. Um, maybe you hear something on TV, a talking head, a radio talking head, and, and you're like, man, I, 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 I stand by that. What he said, what she said, that, that position, I, I, I believe in that. And then you're, you're posting it on your Facebook and links everywhere, and, and you're, you, you, you've bought it, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, but then you hear another viewpoint, maybe a couple weeks later, that maybe you don't even realize it, but it's a conflicting viewpoint, but, but now you're all about that. And again, you're posting links and you're, you're sharing information with your friends and you've bought into that new viewpoint, uh, easily persuaded to believe anything, uh, that would be considered gullible. Especially when you, when you really buy into conspiratorial viewpoints. Like all the time you got a new one and, and we're seen as gullible in that sense. And what does Christ call us to? In Matthew 10, he calls us to be shrewd and wise and, and cunning, not dishonest, but, but cunning and wise and shrewd and, and, and not gullible. So to, with, that, with that as the backdrop, again, what we're talking about today is the purpose of trouble. And a lot of us are going through trouble right now. And, and the pain of indecisiveness, the pain of being gullible. Um, let's read James chapter 1. Now let me give you some backstory here. James, uh, he is the, 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 the brother of Jesus. Uh, he grew up in the same house with Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was the son of God until after Jesus walked out of the tomb. Uh, but he was the brother of Jesus, and then he became a very important church father, important in the foundation of the church 2,000 years ago. And now he's writing this letter to Jewish Christians who are, are spread around the globe, and they're being uh, taken advantage of and mistreated simply because they're Christians. And so James writes this letter to the, the Jewish Christians around the globe. And what he, he uses fancy words, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. He's talking about the Jewish Christians. Let's read. James 1 says, James, I, James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings, he says. And then he says this, consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. Consider it a joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces <clears throat> endurance. <clears throat> Underline that word, endurance. Maybe you're an endurance athlete. It produces endurance. Underline that. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Or lacking nothing. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all generously and without criticizing, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. Um, for the doubter is like the surging sea, driven, tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. An indecisive man is unstable in all his ways. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So today, the purpose of trouble the pain of indecisiveness. A friend of mine, Jack, several decades ago, he was going through a real trial. He was going through a real time of trouble. And he uh, had a decision to make. Do I shut down my business or do I stay the course? Do I let go of my staff or do I, do I keep on going? He would say it was a trial. He would also say it was a turning point in his life. You see, you see, he decided, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay the course. I'm gonna steady as she goes. I'm gonna keep my staff. I'm gonna keep running my business. And for him, that turned out to be decades later a very, very successful business. And he would tell you that that, that was not a, an easy time. It was a trial. It was a trouble. Uh, it was trouble. But but he stayed the course, and and he found joy in those moments of difficulty and the rest is just a beautiful story of his life. James in today's passage calls us really to three steps. I'm going to give those to you. Three steps 
as we look trouble in the face, we stare it in the face. First thing that, that, that James calls us to is this. Count it as joy when you face trouble. Count it as joy when you face trouble. Now, how do we do that? I mean, some of you right now, you're, you're, you're fighting with some really difficult stuff, some trials, some trouble. Some of you are homebound and can't get out, and difficult time. How do we count it as joy when we face trouble? I mean, we're not talking about faking it here, just, just holding your breath and pretending. No, we're talking about it all. But we do want to, with all of our might, pursue joy in the midst of trouble because it will it'll pay off like, like it did in Jack's life. It will pay off if we pursue joy in the midst of trouble. Uh, there's some steps that we can take. There's some st steps we can take. Uh, I mean, the age that, that we are living in is an opportunity, believe it or not, for joy. So let's talk about what that might look like. Um, what gets in our way? Like what hurdles are we going to have to clear if we're going to find joy in this, in this age of trouble? Well, first is, is doubt. Doubt. I know that's really a struggle for some of us. As, as we pray, we're, we're praying and we're, and we're doubting and we're doubting and we're, and we're praying. And sometimes we just want to, like, just throw, I'm just going to throw up my hands. I, I, I don't believe what I'm praying anyway. A, a close cousin to doubt would be fear, right? And hurdles that we're going to have to clear if we're going to find joy in this season of trouble. Doubt and fear. Now, are you, I would ask, feeding that fear, like nurturing that fear, like always thinking about it. You know, you might tell me, you know, Randy, I'm, I just pray in all the time. And, and, and I'm going to say, no, you're just, you're just worrying all the time. Some of us, we, we worry our prayers. I would ask you, are you worrying your prayers? Or are you praying your prayers? It's going to be hard, but, but we're, going to, we're going to need to pursue joy if we can embrace this time of trouble as being actually, actually good for us, ultimately. Not faking it, but how can we clear these hurdles so that we find joy? We have to clear the hurdle of doubt and fear. And another one is loneliness. The Wall Street Journal, just in the last month, had an article that said that the homebound of our nation are turning a welcoming ear to the voices on the other end of the telephone, but often their telemarketers and their bank calls. <laughs> A homebound nation, many of us still staying at home. Uh, we're turning to the telephone to connect because we're lonely. We're alone. Uh, in the article, a customer service agent uh, was quoted as saying, people are quick to pick up calls that in the past might have gone to voicemail. He said, and, and they're eager to share their anxieties. Imagine that with total strangers. Listen, I know you may be at home and you may be all alone and, and loneliness may be just, just filling your heart. I've been praying for some of you that, that God would just move into your space and that, that he would be your companion. Those of you listening today that, that maybe aren't homebound, how are you helping a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a loved one, a church member with their loneliness? Maybe picking up the call and so they can have somebody on the other, other end of the line that they actually recognize. We're going to find joy in this season of trouble, but we have to clear these hurdles of doubt and fear, loneliness. Another hurdle that we must clear would be the, the, the hurdle of lies. And, and, and often in this, in this age, that comes in the form of conspiracy theories. How many of those are you buying into, checking out, posting, sharing with others? Verse 8 in the, today's passage describes the indecisive person as unstable at every turn. Unstable at every turn. Now, now listen, the, the, the purpose of propaganda and, and false news and clickbait and misleading headlines and sloppy journalism and slanted news. Look, I'm talking on both sides of the aisle here. The purpose of that propaganda it's to create an instability in your life so that you don't know if you should go left, you don't know if you should go right, throwing our system into chaos, throwing your system 
into chaos. If we're going to find joy in this, in this season of trouble, we're going to have to clear this hurdle of, of, of lies. And often that comes in the form of conspiracy theories. What are you reading? Where are you going for your news? Look, I, I, we, we need a good source of news, a good source of nonpartisan uh, news, and that's maybe hard to find if, if even possible. Um, but I would suggest that, that probably all the news you need is about 30 minutes a day, really, if you're going to watch it. Maybe 6 to 6.30 p.m. is about all you need in the evening. Uh, anything after that, on, on the cable news especially, it's just meant to make you angry. It's just meant to make you partisan. In my opinion, it's on both sides of the aisle. That news is just meant to create instability in your life. And, and James in today's passage says the unstable person shouldn't expect anything from God. Partisanship. It's when you believe that your team is never wrong and, and you're willing to, to absorb small amounts of, of misinformation and alternative facts because you, you really believe in your team. We're headed the right way uh, and so this is the best option. So you'll put up with little white lies and in contrast to that approach to life we as christians we're called to be wise not gullible if you think you found a secret source of news or information that no one else is talking about uh, then you're probably prone to gullibility and and christians we are we're called to be wise we're also called or actually commanded to not bear false witness that means to spread misinformation about someone else, skewing the facts just a little bit about this, this opponent of yours. We're commanded to not bear false witness. In the, in the, throughout the Bible and in the uh, Ten Commandments especially, look, when I spread a theory that supports my team or my political party without checking the credibility, assuming that even if it isn't totally true, serves a good purpose because my team is, is on the right course, um, then, then, then I'm, I'm bearing false witness. Um, we as Christians, we at times are damaging the witness, the street cred of Jesus Christ. Now, he'll be just fine. He can defend himself, but we're supposed to be upholding the name and the fame of, of Jesus Christ. Just this past Easter, there were some pastors around the country that, that I just think they were making spectacles of themselves, demanding their rights. Um, when, when all of the light and all of the attention, it should have been on the name and the fame of Jesus on that day. We as Christians need to be careful, need to be wise in how we're representing the name, the fame of Jesus. In the age of COVID-19, uh, we're, we're in uncertain times. Uh, we're in scary times, confusing times. Um, there should be a rock. There should be a truth, a foundation on which we stand so that everyone else sees us and takes notice. And, and, and they say, hey, those Christians, they're firmly planted on some truth, the gospel truth, the story of Jesus Christ. They're planted on some truth when, when everyone else is shaken, everyone else is rattled, everyone else is unsteady, but not those Christians. They they're like stable. We're warned if we're double-minded, if we're unstable, we shouldn't expect anything. If we're unstable in everything, we shouldn't expect anything. And that's what James says. So, first of all, we're called by James. This first, this first instruction is to find joy in our troubles. There's a second instruction a second step, and that is let endurance have its full effect. Now, I've thrown a new word at you, endurance. I mentioned earlier, maybe some of you are endurance athletes. Paul, uh, James says, first of all, find joy in your trouble. There's joy to be found. Number two, let endurance be developed. For, for actually, in this passage, it says that the joy of trials will make you, uh, will strengthen your endurance. So what are we talking about? Endurance. Let endurance have its full effect. What are we talking about? Endurance. Well, maybe you're an endurance athlete. Maybe you're a runner. Maybe you're a triathlete. Maybe you swim long distances. You endure the race for a long period.
period of time. I asked myself, who is the, this week, who is the greatest endurance athlete of all time? Because if you went to an endurance athlete and you said, look, look, all the trouble, all those long races in which you want to puke and you're about to fall down and pass out, all that trouble you go through, what is it producing you? They would say this, endurance. That's what James is saying. Who's the greatest endurance athlete you've ever known? Some might say Lance Armstrong. Uh, I I wouldn't. I would say uh, Mark Allen. You may have never heard of him. Um, He was actually voted uh, by ESPN as the greatest endurance athlete of all time. Let me tell you about him. He was a a, a triathlete, a six-time winner of the Ironman World Championship. He won won 20 straight triathlons from uh, 1988 to 1990, 20 straight with, with no losses. Um, um, he, uh, as I said, he's a six-time six, uh, Ironman world champion, Olympic distance world champion, uh, longest streak in the history of triathlons. Um, he is, uh, he's in several Hall of Fames for the Ironman and USA triathlon, triathlons and international triathlons. Here's what's most fascinating to me. In 26 years, um, no one has run a faster marathon at the Ironman in Hawaii than Mark did in 1989. In 1989, Mark Allen ran a two-hour, 40-minute split in the, uh, in the marathon, uh, never, never mind the fact that he also had to swim and he also had to, to bike, and no one has beaten that record in, in, well, since, uh, since 1989, so now that's uh, more than 26 years. That is Mark Allen, and he says this, quote, If experience is the best teacher, then the best teacher is the one with the most experience. (laughs) Get that? If if experience is the best teacher, then the best teacher is the one with the most experience. That's him. He's saying the same thing that James is saying. Look, if you you put in the miles uh, when it comes to trouble, when it comes to trials, if you go through it with joy, and you, you, you make it out to the other end, what you're going to be is you're going to be a person of endurance. Let endurance have its full effect. How do we let endurance have its full effect? By, by embracing the joy. By asking God for, for wisdom in the midst of, oh God, what is this about? If you, if, you would, if you would, Lord, would you show me, what is this about? I want to I embrace this. I don't want to be fearful. I don't want to be a doubter. I don't want to buy into lies. I want wisdom, Lord. Would you tell me in the midst of this time? I don't want the news or Facebook to tell me what this time is about. I want you, Lord, to tell me. Pray for wisdom, as James says, and, and, and the Lord will answer, but you must pray with confidence. You must pray with stability, and the Lord will give you endurance. So the first, the first call is a call to, to, to embracing joy in the midst of troubles. The second call is to uh, allowing endurance to have its, it says, full effect. You know, don't stop short. Keep running. Keep running that endurance might have its full effect. And then the last thing that James says in this passage, then you will be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. You see this progression, number one? Right in the middle of trouble, you're you're, you're finding joy. You're you're a joy hunter. You're seeking joy. You're you're after joy. Right in the middle of trouble. Then as this progresses, endurance, it's happening. You're able to run with more endurance. You're able to run with more stability. You're able to run with more confidence. You're able to run with more wisdom. And then ultimately what happens is then you will be mature and complete and lacking in nothing. I find that so fascinating. James didn't have to say that, but he did. He said, ultimately, what's going to happen is if you allow this endurance to take its course and to strengthen you, you will ultimately be lacking in nothing. Oh, isn't that what we want? That we might no longer lack, that we might have what we need in the Lord. Now, now given the context of this passage, it means this. It means that you will be ready for whatever comes in the future. Whatever comes your way, you'll be ready to handle it. You, you'll be fully equipped to handle it. You, you'll, be, you'll be able to endure more trouble with, 
with, with more confidence and more joy and more wisdom in, in the future. You'll be strong in character. You'll be ready for anything. But what is the key? The key is we must endure. The key is we must pray without doubting. The key is we must, we must be stable, standing on the promises of God, a stable platform on which we stand. So I want to, in closing, I want to encourage you, I guess, in, in three ways. Three things you might consider. Um, number one, when you're going through trouble, I would encourage you to consider turning off the TV and picking up a good book. Yes, the Bible, first and foremost, and there are other good books that will encourage your soul, that will make you wise, not gullible, that, that will feed your soul, that will give you confidence Turn off the TV and, and pick up a book. Step number two. I encourage you to listen to the stories of someone who isn't like you in this era of pandemic and civil unrest. I encourage you to listen to someone whose story isn't like you and then tell him or her your story as well because your story is foreign to them. And then, and then both of you listen to one another because both of your stories are valuable. And both of your stories have something to be offered to the other person. You both have something to learn from one another. And what hurdle is this going to clear as we're listening to one another? One of them is this hurdle of loneliness. Let's grow in our, in our commitment to community in this time. And then the third step that I encourage you in this, in this time of trouble is be willing to deal in facts rather than in partisan propaganda check yourself think through that how am i dealing with dealing in facts are there ways in which i am bearing false witness and so this is what i want for you dear friends i i want for you to find find endurance and, and confidence and, and joy and wisdom and completion right in the middle of a very difficult time James, in review, James calls us, number one, to find joy. It's hard, but find joy in this time. Don't lie to yourself. Find joy. Number two, embrace endurance. Let this, let this endurance have its full effect. I know it's hard. Running's hard, but what does it do? It makes you faster and stronger. Running through trouble, I know it's hard, but what does it do? It gets you to the other end. It makes you stronger and faster wiser and more confident and then this third this third call this third step is ultimately on the other end you're going to be mature you're going to be complete you're going to be lacking in nothing the lord's going to give you through this process what you need look i can't tell you exactly what the god's purpose is in 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 this era of covid 19 i can't tell you what god's purpose is exactly in this era of deep civil unrest. But I do know that his purposes in your life, they're for good. Therefore, joy and endurance and ultimately completion. Love you guys. The author of the, the book in the Bible that we're studying these days, uh, the book of James, um, the author, his name is James, the brother of Jesus, uh, he knew something about trouble. He, he watched his brother, Jesus, go through trouble. He watched him go through the, the deepest, darkest of trials that led to the cross, that led to his execution, that ultimately led to his resurrection, his defeating sin and death. The Bible tells us that, that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. There are those two same words, joy and endurance. Jesus knew on the other end there was something really good. That was the, sal the salvation of humankind. So because of that joy, he endured the cross. And that's what, that's what the table of communion really reminds us of today. That Jesus endured the cross because he knew that the joy would come. And so we celebrate Jesus. He set the, he set the, the, the pattern. He set the example that we might endure that we might chase after this joy that, that, that God promises us in the midst of trouble. Jesus, he's our example. 
On the night that he was to be, to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup. And he said, from now on, when you do this, do this remembering me. Jesus broke the bread and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. He held up the cup and he said, this, this cup, it is my blood spilled out for the forgiveness of your sins. My body, my blood, broken and spilled out for you, Jesus said. So from now on, when you do this, Jesus says, do this remembering me. So that's what we do, Jesus. With heads held high, we celebrate you. You were no victim. You were a conqueror. You conquered sin. You conquered death. And so we come to the table of communion celebrating you. I invite you now right there in the privacy of your home. Maybe you're by yourself. Serve yourself knowing that people around the city are joining with you today in communion. Maybe you're together as a family. Serve one another. And, and in so doing, may you find deep joy in this time of difficulty. I want to thank you for allowing me to come into your home today. Uh, it's a real privilege to serve you in this way. Um, if, if you have any questions, if you have any needs, you want to communicate with me and the elders in any way, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. I want, to, I want to encourage you to give your tithes and your offerings to our ministry. Um, you're at home, you're unable to attend our service, but you can still give online, uh, riverchurchrgv.com. It's, it's easy, it's intuitive, uh, it's safe, uh, it's quick. Um, um, all, all that we do here, all the ministries, everything that we support and all the people that we serve, that's done according to your good gifts. So don't stop. I encourage you to give, uh, and you can do that online. If you uh, want to know what's going on at River Church, you just want to know more about the church, go to our website, check us out. There's a really uh, good calendar of events there and all sorts of information on who we are as a church. Uh, I look forward to the day when you can come back to the building. I, I really do. I, I miss you guys. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I enjoy coming to your home today, and we'll do it again next week. So you guys have a good day. Love you.